Hello everyone and welcome to another video. In today's video we are going to look at the HUT class from uh, the Unreal Engine, or in the Unreal Engine I should say, and use it to make a custom crosshair which also changes depending on the environment, uh, the player's environment. So you can use it as an indicator uh, to let the player know that something can be interacted with uh, right here. Uh, so if you look here of what I have set up here, I just have two doors. Right now they don't do anything because the functionality to use them has not yet been made. We will make that uh, to show the use of you know line, line traces if we've been over uh, before. If you don't know what a line trace is, you can look at a video at the upper right corner right now that I've made, which goes over what they can be used for and what they are. Right. So let's get right into it. First, what we want to do is we want to make a custom HUD class that we can attach to the game mode of the of our entire game, and then use that to draw to be responsible of drawing the actual crosshair on screen, rather than making a widget. So widgets can be a little bit finicky for that, um, and the HUD is basically designed to solve problems like these ones. So let's get to it. First of all, right click, go into blueprints, and then make a game mode base class. And whatever you call it doesn't matter as long as you give it a name. Uh, I called mine BP, BP underscore, as in blueprint underscore, GS game mode. And I called it GS because this project is called Gas Station. You don't really have to think too hard on that one. Uh, then go into your blueprints up here at the top, then go into your uh, project settings here, edit. The, the game mode class and then select it and in here you select your newly created game mode class like so right so now your standard uh, or your newly created game mode class is what you're going to use going forth now open your game mode class and in there go to your hot class here you can see that it needs to uh, have a new class in here but we haven't made it yet so let's go and do that right click go into blueprint class and then pick here you write HUD basically, heads up displays, what that stands for. So pick the HUD class, uh, click select, and then call it whatever you want it to be called. I'm going to call mine BP underscore GS to follow my own, um, my own rules here, my own prefix rules. And then I'm going to call it uh, HUD because I'm that, you know, I'm creative like that. When you've created your HUD class, go back into your game mode class. Make sure that you go to the HUD default class and then pick your newly created HUD class, like so. Compile and save. Right, now we're done with the game mode class. So we, don't, we, will, we will not return to this class. Now go into your newly created HUD class because we are going to create some logic in here. Go to the event graph, delete all of the notes in there already. Then right click and type receive draw HUD. This is an event that is called every time the game requires the HUD to be drawn, which is like every frame, I think. Uh, so this will be perfect for drawing a crosshair because we want it to be constantly visible, of course. What, would, what do we do with this? Well, what we want to achieve is to have some crosshair that we're gonna make, uh, which is placed in the middle of the screen. That's, that's what we want to end up with. So to do that, we're going to use a note called draw material. Here we go. This note here requires a couple of, um, of uh, inputs here, as you can see. And it also requires a material that it will draw on screen. So that's basically all it does. It draws whatever material you give it on screen at the location you give it every time this event is called. So just, you know, connect these two like so. And now we're gonna do a little bit of uh, math to determine where we want the crosshair to be drawn. First of all, go into the uh, material U width, set it to one, and material V height and set that to one. The reason we do this is because this is basically the scale uh, of whatever we want to draw. And we want, of course, to be one so that we can actually see it. You could set this to like half that if you wanted to, to only draw half of the size of your crosshair, but for all intents and purposes, setting them to one is what you would most likely do. Right. So let's draw two uh, notes out of here, right? Let's call, um, we have to divide these by an integer, both of them. 
So both with these, we have to divide them by two. The reason we do that is because we want to be in the middle of the screen and getting the screen size X and screen size Y and dividing those by two will of course end us in the middle. Now convert these to floats, to float. Do that for the other one too, because of course this one over here requires floats. And then what you can do is just try and plug these into screen Y, screen X and screen Y respectively and give it some material that already exists. You can, if you write, if you type in cross here, you should find this one here, C A S C underscore rent across underscore mat, if you pick that, right. Okay, let's try and see what that looks like. So compile and save and play. Hmm, doesn't seem like there's anything here. And that's because we haven't actually given it a size it can work with, like what is the actual pixel size? I'm gonna go with a power of two approach here. So I'm gonna give mine a size of 32 by 32. Press compile and save and then play. And there you go. You now see the cross in the, in, in the middle of our screen. But actually, actually this uh, thing here is not in the middle of our screen. Because if you see here, if I walk over to this door here, try to line it up nicely, you will find that there is a little line there uh, between the actual crosshair and the middle of the screen. And that's because it's not actually drawing it at the middle of the screen, since the origin of the sprite is in the upper left corner of the sprite. So we have to fix that. How do we do that? We just simply have to um, subtract half of the width and height of the float, or the, um, sorry, uh, half the, the uh, width and height of the sprite we wanna, you know, uh, render on screen or material, I guess I should say. So let's do that. First of all, we're going to make a uh, variable that takes care of these two, so we don't have to write that multiple times. So make literal float, like so. All right, and then pull out a an output node here, a reroute node, so we can make it nice and, and pretty to look at. And then whatever comes out of this, divide it by another float and two, so that we get half of the width and height of this um, crosshair we want to draw. So I'm going to put 32 here, like I did in these two before, because my crosshair is going to be 32 by 32 pixels. Okay, so we take this and then we simply uh, subtract these up here with whatever comes out of here. Uh, we do that for both X and Y. So like so, and then we of course draw them into screen X and Y as before respectively. And then we also have to take this and plug it into screen W and screen H like so. With this, we should now have a perfectly centered 32 by 32 crosshair. So let's test it out. And we do, look at that. It's actually in the middle of the line that the two doors create. So now we know it's actually centered. All right, cool. Now this is, um, this is a nice little you know, f piece of functionality here. So let's name it. So let's you know, uh, mark all of it, press C to get a common block. And then I'm gonna type in draw custom crosshair. So what, what we wanna do now is we want to change this to a crosshair that we've made, of course. That's the whole point, right? So let's go and actually make the crosshair. So I'm gonna open up paint.net um, as I've used before. Gonna make a new file. I'm gonna make it 256 by 256 um, so that it gets a nice resolution, <clears throat> excuse me, a nice resolution. Then I'm gonna delete all of the white in there and then I'm going to make a new crosshair. What I'm gonna do first, however, I'm gonna make some, some layers here. And on the, on the upmost layer, I'm going to make a grid. Now, this is not a standard functionality in paint.net. This is something you can go and get a, uh, a plugin for. You should be able to pause the video and get the address there. Uh, and I'm gonna make my grid size 32 by 32. I don't really need that fine detail, then press okay. So now it has made a grid for me that I can draw or use as a guide to draw by, cool. Let's go to the bottom layer and make a new circle. Nope, no, stop, okay. A new circle, 
I'm going to make it a white circle. So I'm going to draw from the upper left corner. Just draw down to the corner here. Now this is obviously a little too big, so I'm going to drag it in a little bit. Just just so it doesn't just so it touches the side of the of the square here. Just like this. Okay. All right, that looks pretty good. And then I'm going to mark all of this, copy it and put it on the second layer. And then I'm going to hold shift so it can only be, you know, cubically changed here. Then I'm going to make it only to these four here, that size. Then I'm going to put it in the middle. I have to zoom in a little bit. I'm going to put it in the middle here, like so. All right. And then I'm going to take the bucket tool and just fill it with white. Oh. Oh no. What happened? Hmm. Something went wrong there. Ah, okay. I see what went wrong. The circle is too undefined. Let's try and minimize it again. Oh, that's the wrong button. Shift, hold it. Just make it a little bit bigger here. Try and place it again. Mm, let's see. No, I'm not happy with that. Uh, you know what? Let's remove the entire circle, then make uh, the lines a little bit thicker, five in thickness. Make a new circle. All right, that's a a lot uh, thicker circle here. Do the same as we did before and then adjust the size like so. All right, and then copy all of it, make a new one. Oh, that's the wrong button again. All right, like so, and then put it in the middle. Yeah, that looks a lot better. All right. Just make sure we fill out all of these like that, I think. Is that good? Yeah, that looks good. Okay. And now we take the bucket tool, we fill out the circle like that. And then we go and delete the upmost layer because we don't need the grid anymore. And this is what we are ending up with, right? And we have to put these layers together as uh, PNGs can only work like that. And then we're going to save as. Oh, let's try that again. Save as. And I have made a folder inside my Unreal Engine 4 folder that I've called raw, which is where I typically put all of my raw files. Uh, for the game itself. That's just how I prefer to do it. You can do it in any way you want to. I'm going to call it uh, circle crosshair and save it. Yes. Okay. And close the program. Now we go into our assets folder here, the content folder, and go into our textures. And we're going to, impl or to import a new texture. And there it is, the circle crosshair PNG open. And we're going into it and we are going to tell the Unreal Engine that this should be seen as user interface because that's what it is. And then the texture group is also UI so that the engine knows about this. Close it down. Right. So now that we have the actual circle, we are going into our materials and we're going to make a new material. I'm going to call it M underscore cross air. Like so. And in here, I'm going to take my texture, texture sample. And from that one, I'm going to put my T. Oh, wait, no, actually, I forgot to name my textures right. Let's go in here to the circle crosshair and say T underscore circle crosshair. That makes it a lot easier to find for me. So, All right, back in the material, we say T underscore. Hmm. 
I did not turn out my crosshair. Why is that? Because I did not write it the right way. That's why. So let me T underscore circle crosshair. There we go. And we take this and we actually only need the alpha channel here. And we put that in the, let's see. Oh, we need to change the material first. Instead of it being an opaque, we need it to be a translucent because then we get the opacity. So we take the, uh, the alpha channel of our texture, put it into the opacity, and there we go. Now, it doesn't actually have a color, as you can see, it's all black. Uh, and that's because it's unlit right now. Uh, there is that, or well, I should say that there is no emissive color. We can change that. But for now, let's just take a simple approach and make a new constant three vector and then set the color to white. Okay, plug that into emissive color. Let's see, let's do a flat surface instead. And there we go. Now there's our circle, nice and pretty. Apply and save. Okay, back in our hot class, we are going into our material and then taking our circle. Uh, did I call it something else? Yes, I did. I called it crosshair. Should really name things consistently in this. And with that, we now have our custom crosshair, the circle in the middle and everything. That's very nice. But we are going to go a little bit beyond that. We're going to go further than that. We are going to make it more interactable. So how are we going to do that? First of all, we're going into our character blueprint. And in here, we're going to make a little bit of magic. First, we're going and making a macro. And a macro is just something you can reuse that does the same thing over and over again, basically. It's, it's just a reusable thing. That's all, really. The, the cool thing about macros is that you don't necessarily have to give them any input for them to work, uh, which is cool compared to something like a function where you have to give it an execution pin. And what we're going to use this for is to get the start and end location of a trace. Uh, so we don't have to make to make use those nodes over and over again. So let's do that. This macro we are going to call get start and end trace vectors, and it's going to have well, that's very small. It's going to have two outputs: the start vector, calling it start here, picking vector, and it's going to have the end vector. Okay. And then what do we do? We go and take our first person camera here and we say we want the world location. And that's our start vector. So just, you know, plug that in there from the get go. However, we also need the end vector. So where is our trace going to end? So get forward vector. And then we're going to do what we've done before. We take this. We multiply it by a float. I'm going to use 150 units because that's pretty close to the actual player itself, which makes sense when you want to make a system where you can use items up close. And then we're going to add the actual uh, start vector and put that out as the end vector, just like that. So now this will come out the same every time we are going uh, to use this macro here, which is very nice. Which also means that if we want to go and change the uh, the length of this vector, we can just go in here and change the number there. Or we could make a variable to do that. I mean, there are so many options. Back in our event graph, we are going to go into our project settings, go down into input, make a new action mapping, and we're going to call it use object. That's what I'm going to call it. Going to make an E button here. E button press E, yeah, because that's what most people are used to. And then, oh, we're there. We're going back into our character and we say use object. Okay. Then, let's see, what are we going to do? We are going to take our get start and end trace vectors, like so. Neat little macro here. And then we are going to say make a line trace by channel. And we just want anything that's visible, which is totally fine. And then we put our start vector into the start node and our end vector into the end node. And look how nice and tidy that is. Makes blueprints much easier to work with when you can do stuff like this. Right, then we are interested in knowing, did we hit something? Um, we're also interested in knowing if we didn't hit something, but that's a little later. And then we break the actual hit result. 
and now we have to make something more. So we go to our uh, blueprints, make an interface folder, at least I did. Uh, then we make a new interface by going to, uh, to right click and then go down into blueprints and then go and pick blueprint interface. And if you don't know what an interface is, link in the upper right corner of the screen right now to an episode I made where I go over interfaces. So we're going to make an interface called use smart object. Or no, actually no, not use, just calling it a smart object. And then we're gonna put interface on it just for clarity's sake. Okay. And then we go into the interface, we make just one function in this case, and we're gonna call it use smart object. Compile and save. Okay, let's close some of these. Now, what do we do with this interface? In my case, I have these two doors here, uh, which can be found in here in my smart objects folder, doors. I have made this abstract outside door, which has a massive mess of a blueprint that I should probably look over and make better, but for now, it's gonna serve its purpose. And in here, this is the object that I wanna use. I mean, this doesn't really matter in the long, in the long run, like it doesn't matter to you at all. You could just make a, a symbol object that does nothing. It doesn't actually matter for what we are gonna make here. And then I'm going into the class settings of this blueprint, going into add and say smart object interface, please implement that, thank you. And at this branch here, I'm going to call the use smart object event. Oh, forgot to compile. Use smart object, here we go, this event here. And plug it in there, there we go. Now I have doors that will work when we are done with this uh, implementation here. So we're closing down that object. We're back in our character. And then we say, we hit an actor, does implement an interface, and we are of course interested in our smart object interface. Then we ask, does it implement this interface? True, okay. Uh, or sorry, true, we hit something, and then does it implement an interface? If it does, then we are going to call, because now we know for sure that it uses this interface. Oh, so we are going to call use smart object, the message version like that, right? Okay, that's good. So now we have a system that works that will be, you know, so I can do this, go up to objects and use them like so. All right, so now we have uh, some very simple functionality here that we are also going to comment for good measure. So let's call this uh, use smart objects because we are, you know, very creative like that. Compile and save. With this now in place, it makes sense to uh, expand the functionality of our crosshair so that it becomes interactable in a way that if you look at an object that does implement this interface here, then, uh, you know, it should be something that uh, that changes the crosshair to indicate this. So let's go and make that. You can implement this in a multiple in a multitude of ways. What I'm going to do here, which is probably a little bit unconventional, is instead of using the tick function to figure out uh, whether we looked at something that implements this interface, I am going to use the look up and look right input axis. So every time the player moves the mouse, which they're probably going to do a lot to influence these two, values, then we're going to check if we look against something of interest, which personally I think is a pretty cool alternative. So let's copy this we've already done down here, put it up here instead, and just drag these in here and in there. All right. Like so. And of course, we should also have a branch here like that and say true. Okay. All right, so this was you know pretty easy to do. Now we just need to put something at this note here and these two note or these two outputs there. But what should we put there? Well, what we need to put there are, are or sorry is the functionality to actually change the crosshair in some way. So let's go back into our HUD uh, blueprint here, and we are going to make some events. We're going to make two custom events. So add custom event. We're going to call it set crosshair white. 
That's the standard color it's going to have when you don't look at an object that can be interacted with. And then we are going to have set, oh, sorry, custom event. And we're going to call it set crosshair. And in my case, it's going to be green. You can call it whatever you want because this is only for yourself. So the color that you want it to switch into is going to go here. In my case, it's going to be green. You can make it any color you want. And then we're going to make a variable that we call target value. And I'm going to explain what we need this for a little later, but you'll see. For now, uh, we make this and then we set it here. So this one, if we want it to be white, we set it to zero. If we want it to be green or whatever color you choose, we set it to one. Okay. Then <clears throat> we use the tick event on our HUD. And it's okay to use tick in this case because it's just a HUD class and it's a very it's going to be a very clean tick event. It's not gonna be cluttered, it's not going to really drag on performance, which tick events tends to do. So we take this, we say event tick, and uh, we are going to use this delta time here to f interp2. And oh, it's not going to go in there. It's going in there. And f interp2 means float interpolate2. And interpolation, sorry, interpolation is just to go between, in this case, two numbers or two values. In this case, two floats. Uh, and we want to go between zero and one in either one direction or another direction. Uh, if you want to switch between white and green, you go from zero to one. If you want to switch from green to white, you go from one to zero. Right. So for now, this is what we're going to do here. Now we have to go and do something in our material. So let's go to our material in our M cross air here. And we're going to do a little bit of uh, material math, I guess I should say. Uh, so take this, this is just going to be our standard color white uh, as before, and then make another one, copy and paste. And this one, make you make that the other color you want. In my case, it's going to be green, such, you know, something like that, I think. 0 0.5 and 0, like that, yes. And then press OK, and that gives me this green color. And then we're going to use a lerp linear interpolate and we're going to pluck this one in here and this one in here and then this one that goes out goes down into emissive color now as standard alpha is zero uh, what we want is something that can change this value alpha from a blueprint so that we can actually switch between these two colors so we're going to make a scalar scalar parameter like so and plug it into alpha. And as standard, it's zero. We're going to say that it has a slider minimum of zero and a slider maximum of one, in case we wanted to make instanced materials, but that's an entirely different discussion. And the parameter name needs to be called something that you can you know, remember in two weeks or two years. So let's say we call it smart object in range. That's what I'm gonna call it. Uh, and then we take this value, and just to show you what I mean, if I take this value now and change it to say 0 0.5, you see that it's in the middle. It's not that uh, visible here, but you'll see that it's in the middle between white and green. But if I take it up to 0 0.7, you can see that it's a lot greener. And if I take it all the way up to one, it's completely green. So I'm back to zero, it's white, like that. So that's what interpolation does or linear interpolation in this case. Okay, apply and save. Just remember this name, I'm gonna copy it so I remember it easier. And then close the material. Now we have to go back to our hot class. And if you noticed, then this interpolation is basically not far from the linear um, interpolation or the the lerp that we just used in the material is what I tried to say. <laughs> so uh, we have to make another variable in here that we call current value. And that's just the current value of uh, the material who, which whose um, scalar parameter we want to change. And since it goes between zero and one, 
then this current value will represent that. So let's try and put that in, that in here. So add reroute, like so. So it becomes a little bit nicer to look at. Take the current value, put it in here, and take the target value. This is the, the, the color we want to go towards and put it in target. Now interpolation speed uh, is something that we're going to set with a divide node. So divide float by float. And here we're going to put 1 because the value goes between 0 and 1. And here we're going to set the interpolation speed. And I'm going to set it to 0 0.1, which means that it's going by pretty fast. You could set it to a higher number, which means that the interpolation will go slower as this goes by world delta time. Uh, but that's up to you. That's a sort of a feeling thing. For me, 0 0.1 works. So that's why I'm, what I'm going with. Then every tick we are going to set we're going to set the value of this to whatever comes out of this okay and then we are going to have to make a material instance or a dynamic material instance as it's called so that we can actually uh, switch um, or sorry uh, uh, tamper with the actual value of the um, of the material. So let's go here and we say begin play. Oh, begin play. And then we're going to say create dynamic material, like so. And we want to make the m underscore crosshair material. And then we have to save that somewhere. So I'm going to promote a variable here. And this variable I'm going to call cross air, oh, there's too many s's, air material, like that. And then I'm going to take this material here, get, yeah, and then I'm going to route it into the input of this uh, draw material over here. So it actually uses this variable instead. Okay, let's make this a little nicer to look at. Like that. Yeah, that's nicer. Okay. And we're going to use that material down here, like so. We're going to say um, set scalar parameter value. Plug that in. And as you see, parameter name is just a string, which is why you have to be very careful when you write in here and make sure that it's completely right, because otherwise this won't work at all. So make sure that that value is correct. And then just drop this in here, like that. Okay, so now we have all the tools needed to actually change the color of the crosshair. So let's, you know, uh, mark all of this, press C to make a common block, and then say uh, control crosshair color. It's a nice little alliteration there. Okay, so good so far then we have, we have to do something so that we can actually trigger these two events here that you see here, set crosshair white and set crosshair green. And the way we're going to trigger them is in the uh, BPGS character here that we talked about before. Before we can do that, however, we have to get the actual game mode that we made. Uh, this, if we go back in our blueprints, this game, oh, sorry. Um, here. This game mode here holds the information about our HUD. So we have to get a hold of that um, somehow. Uh, and we're going to do that through the game character. So we say on begin play, we want to do something. We want to um, get HUD or HUD maybe? No? Oh, HUD, there we go. Um, how do we do this? We say get. I believe it's get HUD. No? Okay. Get game mode. Here we go. Get game mode and then get HUD. No, that's the HUD class. That's not what we want. Let's try something else. Get player controller. And then we say get HUD. Here we go. And then we want to make sure that it uses our custom HUD. So we cast this to BP underscore GS HUD or whatever you called it. Plug that in here. 
And then we promote this to a variable, like so. And this I'm going to just call HUD. So that, you know, it's the player controller HUD reference. That's what I'm going to use there. All right, then we pull that in here, say get. And then if I pull something out here, I should get set cross air green and white. So let's start with white. You take this false here because we didn't hit any objects at all. So we don't want to, you know, switch the color. And then you pull out over here. For, oh, that's not right. Oh, that went completely wrong. You pull out here, make a new reroute node. Like that. Oh, come on. Reroute. There we go. And then you say set cross air green. And you set it to true because in this, you know, in this case, we actually hit an object which implemented it. So that's why we want to set the cross air to green in this case. Uh, what we can do here is we can pull this over here and then do that then we you know we save the two the, a little bit of space there okay with this in place all of this in place all right let's see what we have so let's go to the test map press play oh and i actually have my mouse over something i can use and when i don't it turns white again so just to give it a little bit more demonstration here when i have my mouse over or my viewport sorry over an object that I can use, it turns green. But as soon as I don't, it goes back to white. And you can see that it sort of gradually switches color from white to green instead of just instantly switching, which is a nice feeling to a player as well. So now I have given my player an indicator that they can interact with this item in some way by pressing the E button. But they don't know, of course they don't know what the interaction is, but they know that they can interact with it, just like that. I hope that this has been useful for you. I tried to make this a little bit more special since I now have 100 subscribers. I'm very grateful for that. Thank you very much. Uh, so I hope that this, you know, uh, covered my basis, so to speak. Um, it might have been a little bit confusing to jump back and forth between all the blueprints. I apologize for that, but there is a lot to go through when you want to make a custom crosshair, apparently. Uh, but in the end, you're going to get a, a result, at least I think, which is very nice. Um, it, it adds a lot of nice uh, playability. And um, it's just, you know, we, we are very uh, image-based uh, creatures, I guess I should say. So we, we like to see something change visually uh, so that we can work with that. And this certainly helps in that situation instead of having text, for example, or an icon then this is a very little subtle difference, which, you know, can help the player. You could uh, expand the system and then do even more colors if you wanted to. You just have to be a little smarter on how you actually uh, lurk between colors in your uh, material in here. But I think you could do it. Yeah, I'm sure you could do it. Um, but yeah, I hope this video was uh, useful to you. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe. If you didn't like it, please let me know. This like button is also there for that reason, and uh, I'll see you next time.